On August 27, 2025, the Information Privacy Commissioner of Ontario released a revised finding against the University of Waterloo. The initial report was issued in June this year, and I should have done an episode on it, but I didn't. The case involved what looked like a pretty ordinary thing on campus, just vending machines. Except that these ones weren't just any vending machines. They were said to be intelligent vending machines installed by a third-party service provider, and they secretly used biometric face detection technology. That sounds creepy, and the university was found to have violated Ontario's public sector privacy law. You know, it's not as cut and dried, but there's some really interesting takeaways from that decision. Hi, my name is David Fraser. I'm a privacy internet technology lawyer with the Canadian law firm McGinnis Cooper. I also teach internet and media law at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. Nobody on campus was aware that these vending machines use face detection technology until one of the machines malfunctioned and flashed an error message on its screen, basically outing itself as running facialrecognition.app.exe. Understandably, students complained. It got a lot of media coverage and even some buzz on Reddit. The Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario investigated. At the outset, the University of Waterloo challenged whether the commissioner even had jurisdiction here. The university argued that it wasn't really about Ontario's Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Instead, they said a situation like this was governed by the Federal Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act, or PIPEDA as we call it. The university's reasoning? Well, selling snacks through vending machines is a commercial activity, and PIPEDA applies to the collection, use, and disclosure of personal information in the course of commercial activity. And that meant that the federal law applied, they argued, not provincial law. They also argued that if the vending machine didn't actually capture personal information, as the manufacturer claimed, then there was nothing for the commissioner to investigate. And finally, University of Waterloo tried to limit its responsibility by pointing out that it never contracted for biometric collection in the first place. In their view, if the vendor went off and deployed face detection technology, it wasn't on them. They didn't ask for it, and they shouldn't be on the hook for it. Now, ultimately, the commissioner rejected all those jurisdictional arguments. The decision emphasized that under FIPA, Ontario institutions like universities are responsible for personal information collected by vendors operating on their behalf, even when those vendors are engaged in activities with a commercial character. The commissioner leaned on something called the double aspect doctrine in our constitutional jurisprudence, which says both federal and provincial laws can apply at the same time. In other words, even if PIPEDA could cover the same activity, that doesn't oust FIPA. So the bottom line on the jurisdiction question was that the University of Waterloo couldn't escape the commissioner's oversight just by pointing to federal law or saying, eh, we didn't know. Once personal information was being collected on its campus by machines it authorized, the university was on the hook under FIPA. Now let's get to the merits. So on the merits, the commissioner concluded that machines were capturing facial images, even if only for milliseconds. Not surprisingly, those facial images qualify as personal information under Ontario's Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. Now, the collection wasn't authorized by law. It wasn't necessary for selling chips and chocolate bars, and no notice was given to the individuals near the vending machines. Therefore, in the IPC's view, Waterloo had violated FIPA. In order to find Waterloo at fault or in violation of FIPA, the IPC asks and answers three questions. First, the IPC asked, did Waterloo collect personal information? And the commissioner said yes. Even though the vendor claimed the system only processed images in real time, the images captured full facial images in memory to estimate age and gender. That's enough to count as a collection of personal information. Now, but really, was it really Waterloo who collected personal information? Legally, yes. They had a vendor who was supplying goods and services on their behalf, and the university is responsible for that, even if they didn't actually know about it. So then the IPC asked, was the collection compliant with FIPA? And the answer from the IPC was no. Section 38 sub 2 of FIPA says you can only collect personal information if it's expressly authorized, needed for law enforcement, or necessary to carry out a lawful activity. Selling snacks doesn't need biometric data. It might be helpful for marketing, but helpful isn't the same as necessary. And also, no notice was given that personal information was being collected and why. Then finally, the IPC asked, did Waterloo have reasonable measures to protect personal information? The commissioner said they had decent contract clauses, but they fell down in procurement. They didn't do the privacy risk assessment that could have flagged the biometric capability. That failure meant that they didn't exercise enough due diligence, so they're responsible. So here's where I think the finding is a bit problematic. 
Waterloo had no knowledge of the biometric functionality. They weren't using it. They didn't ask for it. The contract didn't mention it. The vendor who responded to the RFP for vending machines apparently wasn't even aware of this functionality in some of the machines that they provided. That other supplier embedded this capability, and at the time, nobody was aware of it. Now, due diligence usually asks the question with reference to what a reasonably prudent person would have done in the same circumstances. Without the benefit of hindsight, I think the university met that standard. But they could have done better, so the university is still on the hook for a privacy violation. It seems to be holding them to a higher standard, but only based on what we know now. It could have been enough to just give them a gentle slap upside the head saying, you know, it's 2025. We need to assume that everything that uses electricity, and particularly if it's a connected device, has the potential to collect personal information. You need to check. You need to lift the hood, even for vending machines. But think about what this means in practice. Does every university, hospital, or government office now need to disassemble or reverse engineer every piece of technology it procures? Well, almost. Do they need to anticipate hidden biometric features in a vending machine? Or test for surveillance capabilities in every piece of software? That's a pretty heavy burden, one that goes far beyond what most organizations reasonably do. But I guess the standard for reasonable diligence has to be raised. Yeah, we want institutions to take privacy seriously. The procurement processes should involve risk assessments. But here, it feels like the university is being faulted for not uncovering something that was essentially hidden. I'm not sure we can fault them for not asking at the time whether a vending machine used biometrics. We know now, but I don't think they should have been expected to have known back then that they should ask. While the vendor was not in the crosshairs of the IPC's investigations, vendors, I think, need to be mindful. If you build a product with biometric capabilities, you should have to disclose it, clearly and upfront. If it's an Internet of Things connected device, it should be clearly identified as such. There probably is a boilerplate term in contracts that would put the vendor on the hook if they caused their customer to violate any applicable law. So in the end, a finding of having violated FIPA isn't like a criminal charge. The IPC issued two recommendations, which the university agreed to implement. The first was to review their policies to make sure that future collection of personal information complies with FIPA. The second was to implement practices to carry out necessary due diligence to identify, assess, and mitigate any potential risk to personal information throughout the entire procurement process, including during the planning, tendering, vendor selection, agreement management, and termination phases. So there's a lesson here for everyone. I guess it's time to update all your procurement and vendor documentation to ask about any connected or biometric features. Ask detailed questions about every bit of gear being installed and fully understand their capabilities. And personally, I would include reps and warranties in my contracts, allowing for the termination of agreements if there's been any misrepresentation about the possible collection of personal information. One thing also to note is I think this would have gone differently for the university if the vendor wasn't the university's service provider. As I mentioned before, the university is on the hook for all personal information collected by their service providers, whether they wanted the information collected in the first place. But if the university had structured the agreement differently, they likely would have avoided that direct responsibility. For example, if the agreement was more like a bare rental of space for the placement of vending machines on campuses, the element of custody or control of the data likely would not have been there. Imagine the university enters into a lease with Starbucks to put a coffee shop in the library atrium. In such a scenario, you wouldn't really see the university as being responsible for Starbucks collection of personal information as part of their Starbucks rewards program. But, or maybe the privacy commissioner would take a different view. I kind of hope not. In any event, there are more than a few lessons to learn from this finding, and I hope it's been of interest. The discussion was obviously at a pretty high level, but hopefully provided a general overview of this decision and some of the key takeaways. I try to put out a new video every few weeks, so if you're interested in this sort of content, please click the like and subscribe buttons. Also, leave a comment if you have any questions or if you have any suggestions for other topics to cover. And of course, feel free to share this with anyone who you think may be interested in hearing about Canadian tech and privacy law. Thanks for tuning in.